All right, so I would like to welcome back everyone. And um, just wanted to say that it was very great to hear from the experiences of patients um, and also to hear what the hospitals and the care, various care centers are doing across the province um, to improve the experiences of SCD patients presenting um, at the emergency department. Um, and uh, to continue with the conversation, uh, Mrs. Lanray will present on a study undertaken by SCAGO to identify hospitals that are in need of education to provide optimal care for patients living with sickle cell disease in Ontario. Um, uh, as some of us will know, Ms. Landry is the president and CEO of SCAGO, so stands for the Sickle Cell Awareness Group of Ontario, and is also the founding president and CEO of the Sickle Cell Disease Association of Canada. Uh, she is also a co-founder and the immediate past president um, and CEO of the Global Alliance of Sickle Cell Disease Organizations. Her passion for sickle cell, sickle cell advocacy um, stems from a personal instance hitting close to home. And um, in the late 90s, her brother, Sunday Afolabi, suffered from avoidable and treatable complications of sickle cell. And that led to his preventable and premature death. This propelled her, or this propelled, propelled within her a passionate interest in patient quality access care. So from that time on, she immersed herself in community health advocacy and research initiatives. So uh, Mrs. Lenry, um, just let me know when you're ready and then feel free to um, go on and present um, on the research report. Thank you very much, Ms. Marie Pasco for that very warm and kind introduction. Um, can you see the screen with um, what um, Kala has shared? Did you see that screen, the yes. abstract? Okay, wonderful. So that's what we're going to present today. So um, Kala, are you able to make it bigger a little bit so people can see it better? Okay, no, it's kind of zooming out. Okay, no worries. That's fine. We'll make do what we have. So I wanted to say that in 2019, um, the Sickle Cell Awareness Group of Ontario, um, due to the many, many uh, uh, feedback from patients and their family members around the quality of care that they do receive in Ontario hospitals um, and providing those feedback to schedule letters to embark on what we call a more formal approach in you know, putting the patient perspectives on the quality of care uh, that they do receive in Ontario hospitals together. So in 2019, we embark on that project. We closed the project in February um, 2020. So I'm gonna provide a little bit of background, but first of all, I want to recognize um, that um, Dr. Susan Williams, um, was supposed to co-present this with myself today and she has put this abstract together with a few tweaks from myself. And so I wanna thank her that while she's not able to present today, uh, we're still able to um, share this abstract with everybody. So in collaboration with CKIDS, Dr. Melanie Corby, um, and so Dr. Susan from CKIDS, in collaboration with Dr. Madeline Verhovsek from McMaster, University and also she also represents Hamilton Health Center um, and also Dr. Jennifer Bryan from UHN. Uh, I believe we did a good job in collecting the patient perspectives as you'll find. So the background, we know that sickle cell disease is an inherited multi-organ disorder and we know that its complications can be acute and also chronic. Um, as you know, about 6,000 people have sickle cell disease in Canada and 3,500 of them, which is translates to about 58.3% live in the province of Ontario. We also know that um, a lot of the hospital visits of individuals with sickle cell disease, um, you, know, um, you know, end up in emergency care. And again, like we we're saying, could it also be um, something that we need to look about it could also be of uh, something of concern. Um, why are patients more and more ending up in emergency department? And overall, this study is again looking at the patient perspective of the quality of care that they have received 
in order to help us to identify um, areas for improvement. So um, now the study design, um, sorry, give me one second. And it should be, good. In the study design, about 49 questions um, were provided via survey monkey and it was shared through different outlets, um, Skegos newsletter, the WhatsApp group, other sickle cell associations. And again, between July 2019 and February 2020, we collected about 66 uh, um, responses from the sickle cell community. How do we interpret the uh, data that we collected. So we kind of define the care type based number one on the time frame within which the care is provided and number two on the quality of care that the patient is telling us that they have received. So we, we code the narratives as either optimal care is received or suboptimal care is received. So if um, care um, is received by the patient um, within 30 minutes um, after triage or 16 minutes after registration. Um, and if the patient believes that they have received the right dosage of pain medication um, or treatment at the, and promptly at the right time. And also if the, L, if, the, if the patient or their caregiver believe that the health care provider that attended to them were respectful, then we will call that experience as optimal. Where the patient or their care provider um, did not get forced analgesia um, within 30 minutes of, of being triaged and or 60 minutes of showing up in the hospital and registering, or if they do not think that they have received the right medication or the right dosage, and you do not think that the healthcare providers were respectful of their needs and concerns, then that will be coded as suboptimal. In terms of results, um, again, about 66 people completed the survey, uh, and 64 of them are female, 36 of them from male. But then the age range of those who responded were um, typically 18 to 64 years of age. Um, and those who are not within that age, they, their responses were inputted by their parents or other caregivers. Um, it, so typically um, you find that in the questions that we ask, not everyone answered all questions because we didn't make any, we didn't make it compulsory that you have to answer all questions. We want you to answer what you're comfortable answering. And so I believe the highest number of questions answered by one individual is 38, and the least question answered is five, but it still gave us a good opportunity to understand the quality of care that the patients in the province are receiving. So it's very, it's very interesting um, to know that uh, in terms of location of the, um, you know, of presentation, in the, in the um, hospital, um, you find that while we have a good amount of people, um, about 20 who did not, um, about 20% did not indicate where in the hospital they have, you know, you know their, their point of presentation in the hospital, we find that for those who did indicate emergency room, is the um, is where they are showing up a lot, and again, in my mind, that is something that we need to, uh, you know, to deal with. Why are they showing up in the emergency? Um, it shouldn't be comprehensive care. Uh, I believe is the way for this disease, and so showing up in emergency shouldn't be. So you find those who are showing up in outpatient and in admissions are way less, emergency is high. Now, if you look at the hospitals that um, are indicated in the study, um, you find that Toronto 
Um, many of the hospitals in the Toronto area are the are they are very much where the a lot of the patients that did complete the survey have visited, even though we also have Brampton, Etobicoke, Kitchener, Oshawa, London, and Mississauga. I also want to mention that even though some hospitals are not mentioned here by the by the respondents, it doesn't mean that these are all the hospitals that are visited because about 23 of the respondents did not indicate which hospitals they have gone to receive care. And this could also be to, it could be due to fear of, you know, a backlash because again, they provided their name and they, they, they may not want to, you know, have any sort of a backlash uh, to affect their care. Um, because I find that out of 666 respondents, 23 not indicating which hospital they have showed up is also uh, very alarming. So when you look at the time to assessment, we have provided the different colors um, as you will find in the horizontal bar. Um, you find the, the, the blue uh, representing if they are, if the time that it takes them to be assessed is less than five minutes. The green is five to 15 minutes. Nursing con um, yellow is 15 to 30 minutes. Um, orange is 30 to 60 minutes and red is more than 60 minutes. Now, when you look at the physician contact, for instance, majority of the respondents, um, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, physicians did not uh, connect with them um, under the 60 minutes that is provided in the clinical handbook. So, and then also, um, when you're looking at the nursing contact also a higher number of percentage of the respondents, about 30 percent um, felt that the nurses did not connect with them um, on a timely manner. It's way more than 60 minutes before they got a nurse to connect with them. Um, and you see that, um, you know, it's the same thing also for the administration of medication. Um, again, it's way more than 60 minutes before they get their first analgesia. Even though the recommendation is the first analgesia should be administered within 60 minutes. Um, so that's something I wanted to really um, put our attention to. Um, even though I find for the nursing contact, um, I, you know, it, it, rightly following it is about 15 to 30 minutes which is, you know, um, which is not bad compared to uh, when you think about the physician contact um, and you think also about the administration of medication. Now, when, you, when we talk about, when we ask them, how do you feel about the, um, your experience, right? In the quality of care that you have received, does it meet your expectation? 54% um, of the individuals that complete this um, survey, this particular question, um, advise us that the quality of care they have received, um, you know, did not meet expectation, is below expectation. That is more than half. And 34%, 34%, uh, you know, felt like, okay, it's somehow, uh, you know, meet some expectation and 12% um, feels that it exceeded their expectation. Now, one thing that we need to bear in mind here is that the 34% and the 12% that felt that um, the quality of care they have received did meet um, expectation or exceeded expectation are more in the pediatric setting and the 54% more in the, um, more in the um, adult setting. So again, I think that is also iterating what we've been hearing today, um, you know, that um, the quality of care that the adults are receiving in Ontario, uh, majority of the respondents did not think that it is optimal for them. Now, when we go to interaction with the first person encountered, I find this to be very, um, you know, very encouraging. And I'll tell you why, because 
um, when you look at the, um, you know, the horizontal bar, you can see that the green line, you can see that all, a good percentage of the respondents uh, believe that the care providers that have connected with them are caring, um, empathetic, and respectful. And as we know, with um, sickle cell care, the first person you encounter is also very important. So we find about 65% or so there um, believes that um, the, 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 the first respondent, which may likely, which will be the triage nurse and those that they first meet uh, are caring, they are empathetic and they are respectful. Right? We can always we can also see that about thirty five percent are neutral, so they not they can't really say if uh, the first person they encounter was caring, empathetic, or respectful. But again, um, they are they are neutral, and we also have um, you know about uh, twelve percent who said that they don't know. Uh, but again, it's encouraging that a good number of the patient felt that the first person encountered, you know, is caring. So when we ask the question around responsiveness of healthcare workers to needs, um, we find that um, about 18% um, felt that the healthcare workers, well, which include the healthcare professionals, the doctors and all that um, attend to them uh, were extremely responsive to their concerns and their needs. Um, and you find that about, I would say about 12% felt that the healthcare providers are very responsive. And, but a larger number at about 45% um, feel that the healthcare workers are somewhat responsive and uh, to a lesser degree at about um, 22, um, percent uh, file, you know, are, are minimally responsive. And so um, somewhat responsive is the um, response of those who have completed this uh, question. When we ask about negative experience during treatment, um, again, the, the green line means no. Um, yellow means don't know, um, the blue is neutral, and the red is yes. When we ask about the negative experience during treatment, we find that um, while majority did not provide, especially for when we talk about stereotyping, um, you find that majority um, chose green at about 50% of those who answered that question, and they do not feel like they have been stereotyped. And also when you think about the fear of dying, about 45% do not have the fear of dying due to maybe a negative experience during treatment. And I would say also about 12% do not feel helpless and lonely. However, when you talk about helplessness and loneliness, a high percentage um, at about 40 something percent there, felt that they were airplace, they were lonely, because I guess they were not receiving the right care at the right time. And um, again, about 22% were afraid of dying. And in terms of stereotype, it's also at about 22%. However, um, again, you know, we find varying uh, our responses um, from the respondents on how they feel. Um, thinking back on this study um, and reading, you know, the uh, responses from the respondents, I recollected one of the patients um, expressing that they felt, like they actually felt that no one cared, that no one cared uh, because nobody was listening and they felt very, very helpless and very, very lonely, um, um, you know, while being in, the, in that um, situation in that particular hospital. Um, so um, that is something that I think we need to pause and think about to say, 
you know, taking care of the patient. Um, we need to consider also their emotional state as well, you know, how they're feeling, um, you know, at that time. Am I doing enough for them to ensure that they are feeling safe, you know, in that space? Um, when we asked the question, was healthcare workers knowledgeable? Um, about 20% felt that the healthcare workers were extremely knowledgeable. About 40% felt that the healthcare worker was, was very knowledgeable. And about 30% had somewhat knowledgeable and about 10% uh, at not at all. So again, um, this um, is relative to each individual, which hospital they've been to and the care that they have received. So to conclude this, um, we came to a few conclusions. Number one, we uh, are able to identify um, areas for potential improvement for sickle cell disease care in hospitals. Uh, one of the main areas is wait times. If you can see um, right here, time to assess. Um, again, to get to see the physician, to get a nurse contact, to even get medication were way over 60 for most of the respondent. Um, so wait times to receive care is one of the areas we've identified. We also identified that healthcare providers need to be more responsive um, to uh, patient needs. As you find here somewhat um, is what we find that majority are saying. So it's not, it's, it's, it's fear but we, there could be improvement here. Um, and also to be aware that, you know, um, you know, the negative experiences, how also it is impacting the patient, you know, during care and treatment is very important. We also wanted to identify the limitations of the study. There is a low number of respondents and we are not sure it could also be due to the fact that people um, have to, uh, you know, there was, a, there was some questions in there with people providing their names and people may be afraid, as you know, with sickle cell disease, there's a lot of stigma and bias and stuff like that. And, and we find that individuals with lived sickle cell experience are very cognizant of, and many times worry about, will this get back to my healthcare providers and will that impact the quality of the care we receive next? So, um, there was low number of respondents, right? And so that is one of the things that we did notice um, in, this, um, in this study. And some of our next steps is what, what we did. So after we put the, uh, the summary and the result together, we connected with different hospitals in Ontario. So we did not just connect with the hospitals who were identified in the study alone, we connected with hospitals across the province to um, provide them with a summary of the study and also to, um, to you know, um, discuss with them what they're doing to improve the quality of sickle cell care in Ontario and also asking them what can they do more based on the narratives of the Ontario sickle cell patient community. And so we did that. And based on the narratives, we know that many of the Ontario hospitals are working very hard to even improve what they are currently doing. We also met with the Ministry of Ontario and we presented to the Ministry of Ontario the gaps in care and how the gaps needs to be, um, needs to be um, addressed. And one of the things that we recommended to the Ministry of Ontario was to also have um, to, to provide funding um, to, you know, for more resources for the uh, five, for five um, of the sickle cell centers of excellence that we have in Ontario that currently um, have needs around staffing. So um, I know the Ministry of Health is working with the hospitals in terms of that. And so that is one of the things that we've done. And we also wanted to follow up with you, the sickle cell community, and you know, by bringing the, the, um, our healthcare providers, our hospitals in this um, summit with you today 
to help you understand what the hospitals are doing to improve you know, the quality um, of care that they provide to you when you do go to the hospitals. Uh, and you can find as part of the presentations over the last two days, the hospitals have been sharing you know, what, they, you know, what they're doing um, to improve the quality of care. Um, again, we have, you know, again, as mentioned, there is improvement strategies that the hospitals uh, have been putting together and they're sharing that with you today. And we also encourage um, this continued dialogue and we will continue as an organization to follow up with the hospitals in partnership, of course, with you, um, you know, the patient community to ensure that um, the, the, the care that we provide in this province, we want to make Ontario, you know, you know, that model of care, right? The sickle cell care in Ontario as a model for the country and for many countries um, to ensure that we have stalwart program that would be the heavy um, of sickle cell program, you know, not only in Canada, but I would say globally. And I know we can do it by working together. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Mrs. Larry. And um, I would also like to thank the Chicago team, uh, the Chicago research team, and um, all the various institutions that have helped to um, put this uh, research together in this report um, and on collecting the data that um, really confirms the experiences that has been recounted by our various um, community members in the sickle cell disease community um, on the type of uh, on the type of care that they receive um, when they present at the emergency room. Um, uh, I would like to uh, use this time to um, move to the Q&A se session, recognizing that um, uh, keeping in mind time. So um, maybe we'll just have time for just one or two questions. But um, Mrs. Lanray, I just wanted to know, um, and I also welcome uh, the various participants also, if they have any questions to type them in the chat. But um, just one question for you, Mrs. Lanray, just wanted to know, um, after presenting the research study to the hospitals, what are the types of, um, like what has been the reaction or the attitude of the hospitals that you have been presenting the study to? Um, thank you, Ms. Poco. So I can tell you that um, every hospital we met me, that we met with have been um, very, number one, they were very eager to, uh, when, I, when, I do, when I do request for meetings with them, they are very eager to meet and to learn about the study. And that itself is very encouraging. We all, and all of the hospitals that we do meet with um, were very humble to recognize where um, they could be improving, where they need to improve. And, and I know that many of them started to actively work um, from that meeting um, you know, work even harder. I know they've been doing great work before, but they're working harder to improve the quality of care. For instance, not York shared yesterday, and uh, we met with them. We have patient, uh, we presented the patient experience and everything with as relates to their hospital. And right away, they wanted to meet with the patient if possible, and they wanted to, you know, to see what they can do. And they did a good job um, creating different new programs. So, and so many other hospitals that we met with. So in general, I would say that the hospitals were responsive and they um, started to work to improve what they're doing. So it's been very good uh, responses from all of the hospitals that we did meet with. Thank you. All right, thank you for sharing that. And um, I don't think we have any other questions from uh, participants, but I would like to ask another question. Um, and this, I know the conversation so far has been revolving around um, hospitals uh, and what hospitals are doing. However, I just wanted to know um, to what extent do you think that governments and you know our political leaders can be useful um, to ensure that hospitals and care centers um, continue to deliver adequate services to people with sickle cell disease? And also like what role that, that, it can, that the government can play to bridge the gap between 
the quality of services um, that are provided by local hospitals versus what is provided by major health centers. I know we spoke about a little bit about funding that's needed, but wondering if you have any other thoughts on what, um, what other supports that the government can deliver to fulfill that. Thank you so much, Ms. Poco. Um, I wanted to say one thing. Sickle cell disease is relatively uh, new in Canada, right? So, um, and again, it's a, it's, it doesn't affect majority of Canadians. So it's considered a minority health issue. So this is where advocacy is important, right? So because otherwise they don't know what your needs are, they don't know what it is. And then if you think about it as a politician, uh, you may typically want to put resources or funding or support in areas that may get you reelected because if you have more people, you know, maybe a, maybe a disease like diabetes or high blood pressure that do affect more Canadians, right? So we, we know and we recognize that sickle cell is rare. And this is why we intensify advocacy to ensure that our voices are also heard. And we've been working with the ministry for many years, but I can tell you that this administration is listening. And we've had many meetings with them and we continue to have meetings with them. They are working with us to ensure that Canadian health, um, sorry, I would say provincial, Ontario, health care providers are held accountable on the quality of care that they do provide. Now, to make them accountable, they must first know what is the right care. They need to know, right? Before you start to hold them accountable. And this is why we, we are working with the ministry to make sure that the clinical handbook for treating sickle cell disease and other standard of care guidelines, like the Ken Himstad uh, statement, um, you know, on sickle cell care and so on becomes, you know, routine that every healthcare provider in the province knows about, right? And, and so having that quality care. And yesterday, I know at the session, yes, one of the sessions yesterday, we talked about maybe even having um, some kind of a poster in emergency and the inpatient and so on can also help to remind care providers on the, the right care at the right time to provide. So it's something that we all have to work together. And I'm very grateful that, you know, um, since the summit started yesterday, we have Ministry of Health representatives on, on every session hearing and listening, uh, because it's very, very important um, that we work with them, right? We work with them and they, they are listening. We are having meetings um, in order to ensure that you know, we improve the quality of care. So with the patient community, the care provider community, and also the government um, who will help to bring about the right policies and make the right changes to happen in the system, um, the health system leaders, uh, I believe um, we will move sickle cell to the next level from where we currently are. Thank you. All right, thank you for your answer. I will take one more question. And uh, that's coming from the participants who, one of, the, of our participants who's asking if there's work being done in supporting those with sickle cell and their family members emotionally, mental health um, in those centers that currently don't have the support. Is it possible to start to have the social workers in the hospitals doing more to support not only in hospital, but also in community care? Um, sorry, so this individual is asking um, if we can have social worker not only in the hospitals but also in community care. Yes. Um, when there's the community care, you did referring like in community health centers or like what are they referring to? I'm assuming maybe just, um, I guess, in advocacy, like people that, for example, in uh, communities or advo uh, advocacy organizations, like. Yeah. that um, people with sickle cell disease are involved in. I yeah. Think. yeah. So again, it all comes to resources, right? So, um, but it's a great advocacy uh, effort. And to be honest with you, even some of our centers right now don't even have a full-time social worker. So let's start from there. Uh, the Centers of Excellence, supposed to provide comprehensive care for individuals with sickle cell disease. And we wanted to make sure that those centers are adequately uh, equipped with the right staff resources. Again, like I mentioned earlier, uh, patients showing up in emergency is not right. This is not where we need to be showing up. If patients do receive comprehensive 
adequate care, there'll be less uh, uh, reasons to go to the emerge department, right? So having the comprehensive care centers, have social workers, have nurses, have all of those, I think is very, is very, is very, very important. And that is what we are doing right now, advocate, uh, advocating with the Ministry of Health to ensure that every center has full-time nurse, full-time social worker, full-time, you know, hematologist to support the patient care, right? Once we get that, then we can we can seek for more resources, right? So, you know, you you take one, you deal with it. And then once you receive that, then you ask for more. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I just wanted to say, I think there are more questions coming in, but again, due to the interest of time, we'll have to move uh, to the other section or segment of our summit. So um, thank you so much again, Ms. Lemmy, for presenting the report. And I will actually move it, pass it back to you to um, introduce the next set of next set of our panelists.